Hello and welcome to another episode of Inside the Tanks. Today we're in the workshops of the Tank Museum here in Dorset to take a closer look at what was the only British tank to serve throughout the entirety of the Second World War, beginning with the British and ending with the Australians. I give you the infantry tank Matilda II A12. By the time of World War II, the British Army had decided that it wanted three main types of tank to suit differing tactical requirements. Light tanks for reconnaissance, heavily armoured infantry tanks to support frontal attacks, and fast cruisers to exploit breakthroughs and take on enemy tanks. In the mid-1930s, Hugh Ellis, who was the commander of the British tanks in the First World War, becomes Master General of Ordnance, and is taken with the idea of a supporting tank for the infantry. The problem is, Britain at the time has very little money for tank investment. So the first Matilda, the A11, was built on a shoestring, and it showed. As soon as it was completed, there was the realisation that something better was needed. That something was the Matilda II, which began production in the late 30s, with just under 3,000 being made by the end of the production run. The Matilda II was, in very limited numbers, ready just in time for World War II, and although somewhat limited in armament and speed, soon gained a formidable reputation because of its almost impenetrable armour. They wreaked havoc in the North African theatre of war, where they became known as the Queen of the Desert. So let's take a closer look at the exterior, beginning at the front. Now the Matilda II was designed to get amongst the thick of the action, and it is well armoured, 78 millimetres at its thickest point. Directly in the centre, we've got the driver's cab, and he's got a direct vision port and also a periscope, so vision wasn't actually that bad. On the left and right, we've got a couple of stowage bins. Now, like any tank crew, it's important that everything is kept in the same place. Firstly, because of course, the crew need to know where everything is. And secondly, because if there is any rotation of crew, a new crew member comes in, they need to know where everything is as well. As an example on the Matilda II, in this left-hand armored bin, we would have found the cooker and all of the rations. The entire side of the tank is covered by about an inch of armored plate. And you can see there are a number of access hatches to allow us to get to the suspension system. This access hatch we've actually pre-opened, and inside there you can see the spring system for one of the double bogies. This suspension system was sometimes referred to as the Japanese type, not because it had been developed in Japan, but because it had first appeared on the Vickers Medium Mark C tank sold to Japan in 1928. It wasn't very effective at high speeds, but tests showed that it was very good at the sort of speeds expected of the Matilda. At the front we've got the track adjuster, which actually tightens the idler. If we move further back then, we can see the configuration of our tracks. Now you notice on this particular Matilda II that we've got top rollers. However, on some of the other variants, there are actually a simple set of skids that the track sits on top of. The great thing about the skids was there was very little maintenance involved, and of course they were cheap to manufacture. Did they work well? Well, yeah, for a vehicle that only does around about 16 miles per hour, they were certainly up to the job. All the way down the side of the vehicle, we can see these cutaway portions known as mud chutes. As the name suggests, the idea of these was simply that all of the mud and dirt picked up by the tracks falls down and falls away from the vehicle. Now, it sounded really good in theory, but it didn't work quite so well in practice. And probably the final thing to mention whilst we're at the side of the vehicle are the road wheels themselves. Very simple road wheels that worked really well. However, there was no rubber on them, so it did mean that the Matilda was a very noisy tank whilst it was driving. On the side of the turret, we've got one bank of two smoke grenade discharges, and these are actually fired from inside the turret. Here at the rear of the tank, a couple of things to mention. Now, the Matilda II has got two exhausts fitted, one on either side, and you'll notice at the moment that the exhaust is actually not connected to the muffler. The reason being, well, this particular tank at the moment is having quite a lot of maintenance work carried out here in the workshops. Another thing conspicuous by its absence, here you would find a fuel drum. And the final thing is the doorbell. Now this was a very simple push button that allowed the infantry on the ground to send a signal to the crew inside the tank to let them know that they were actually there. The Australians actually later on in the war improved it by actually fitting a proper tank telephone. As I mentioned earlier, money was tight in the 30s. So two engines from a London double-decker bus were actually used to power the Matilda II. These engines were a pair of AEC six-cylinder diesel engines, which combined supplied 87 horsepower. 
As I mentioned earlier, the tank had a top speed of around 16 miles per hour on the road, which was twice that of the Matilda 1, and it also had a range of around 160 miles. The Matilda had six gears. In later variants from May 1941, we saw a Leyland engine installed, which increased the horsepower to 95. Here we are now inside the turret of the Matilda 2, and straight away you can see what a small space it is, especially when you consider there's a crew of three inside here. So we've got the commander, the gunner, and the loader across to the right-hand side. Now at the moment, I'm sort of stood on the turret floor where the commander would be. The commander's hatch is directly above me. Visibility for the commanders on the Matilda 2 was very poor, just two periscopes up there for them to use. So most of the time, the commander used to sit on the seat, just to my right here, and actually have his head outside to command the vehicle. The transmitter or the wireless set, very straightforward fitting in here. This particular one is the number 19, which was a more modern radio. We also had a number 11 that was fitted to the Matilda 2, the earlier variant. The differences between the two were the earlier one, the number 11, only allowed for one-way communication, i.e. the commander could talk to the crew, but the crew couldn't talk back. With this one, they actually had a full intercom system. And that's really about it for the commander's position. As I said, not a lot of room, very, very tight. Let's take a closer look at the gunner. So I've dropped down now into the gunner's position in the turret. And the first thing to say is it's incredibly uncomfy. There's absolutely no room whatsoever for the poor old gunner. Just to the left, he's got a periscope. So this is his only vision of the outside world. Some of the controls, starting across on the left, we've got the Travis gearbox. And on the Travis gearbox, we've got the Travis handwheel with a dog clutch in there. Now, Travis for the Matilda could either be power Travis or hand Travis. Power Travis allowed a full rotation in around about 18 seconds. And that was done via a duplex control, which would have been down here. As I mentioned earlier, this particular vehicle has having a lot of maintenance done on it at the moment. So actually the control for that is not currently fitted. As far as aiming and firing the gun was concerned, well, it's super straightforward. So Travis onto the target, whether that's by manual Travis or whether it's by power Travis, and use the sight here with a magnification of times 1.9 to actually lay onto the center of the target. Inside the site, there is a small reticle, very, very simple. Aiming for elevation was even simpler. He'd look through the site, put his shoulder to the gun, and then literally elevate or depress the gun onto target. To fire the gun just underneath the breech ring, we've got two pistol grips. On the left, we've got the pistol grip for the main armament, with a safety catch on the side, and on the right, we've got one for the machine gun just to the right of the main arm of the breech ring. And that's really about it for the gunner's position, as I said, not a great position at all. So let's move across and take a closer look at the loader. Again, the loader, pretty limited for space, but certainly better than the commander and the gunner. Directly above him, he's got a hatch. Now, when this hatch is fully closed, he's got no visibility at all to the outside world. So he's got no episcope or periscope. He can see anything on there. Now, his responsibilities, of course, for loading the two-pounder and also loading the 7.92 millimeter Beezer machine gun located just to the right here. As far as ammunition was concerned, 93 rounds of main arm and ammunition could be carried on the vehicle, located in various stowage positions throughout the tank. Now, armoured piercing was the only nature of ammunition issued to the Matilda crews. It wasn't because HE wasn't available for the two-pounder, it just wasn't issued to the tank crews. As far as the machine gun was concerned, 2,925 rounds of 7.92mm ammunition, again stowed in various places throughout the tank. The final thing really to mention for the loader's position, if you recall earlier on, I mentioned about the smoke grenade discharges located outside on the side of the turret. Well, here you can see the control for it looks remarkably like a brake lever for a bike. And that's about it for the loader's side. Let's now take a closer and final look at the driver's position. Hi, I'm Aaron. I'm a technician here at Boverton Tank Museum and I'm going to show you through the controls and some of the quirky things on Matilda 2. Starting here in the driver's compartment, uh, we have a pre-select box uh, that is powered by two Leyland engines. Uh, normal tiller steering, so left to go left, right to go right. Uh, but before we get anywhere on that, uh, you've got the starting up procedure. We switch to 24 volts, and then we unwind the engine clutches you then can start the two engines individually. Starting with the left-hand engine, you then wind the left-hand clutch in, and same again with the right-hand engine. Once both engines are running, you then switch back to 12 volts, and that gives you uh, power to your gauges and charges to batteries. 
At that time, air pressure is building and then you'll be able to move the vehicle. Driving this vehicle is quite straightforward with the pre-select gearbox. You just have to remember what gear you're in. As well, at the same time, this vehicle doesn't have any reserve power, meaning it is crucial that you select the right gear for the terrain you're on and when coming up to bends. Keeping that in the back of your mind, it is a very straightforward vehicle. All you have to do is remember that. Also, this vehicle comes with an infantry doorbell and every vehicle needs its own horn. I'm now going to pass over to Chris, our head of collections, and he's going to go into more detail about the restoration on Matilda 2. So Chris, restoration of the Matilda 2, out of all of the possibilities you've got within the museum, why choose the Matilda 2? Good question. We, um, we obviously have, a, as you know, a lot of vehicles, but it was always about um, this vehicle, we, it sort of broke down in our care in many ways. So rather than just going to the next one, let's actually fix what, uh, what, uh, what we have to. And there was always so much focus on the German vehicles. Of course, Tiger 1 through 1, very important vehicle for us. But I think it's also put things into perspective by having some of the key British vehicles as the Tank Museum in Bovington uh, running. So uh, yeah, we were all quite keen on this. It's a very yeah, pe peculiar British vehicle. And it had a multiple a series of failures. And as often with these projects, you look into them and it goes from one thing to the next. And initially thought it was a repair. It actually started with the gearbox, which we're still looking at now. <laughs> so we thought, oh, it's just a gearbox repair. But before you know it, we started looking at it and everything, the wiring, the engines, the systems. It was a very tired vehicle. And then it turned into a restoration project. We did a big proposal for it. We got some funding from Mars Council. Um, and we did in the end a three-year project. Uh, it was a big learning curve for us. Um, but uh, it was a very, very good project for us. I learned a lot from it, from a project management point of view, from a skills point of view. But yeah, for us, it was key for a, important to us as the Tank Museum, have a key British vehicle in the running collection. A again, it was running in the past. It sort of broke down and we wanted to repair that and we wanted to learn from that and have a, have a good variety of vehicles to be able to demonstrate to our visitors. And I think it highlights, you said, that, I mean, although you did a very lengthy restoration on this vehicle, I mean, Maintenance is ongoing. We throughout the video we've been saying there's obviously you know bits that are off at the moment, and we've got the gearbox yes, sat on the floor uh, at the moment. So what's the problem with the gearbox? The problem is it's not in there. Uh, um, <laughs> it started with the gearbox that had failed actually um, for a variety of reasons, and it was it's a pre-selector gearbox, a Wilson pre-selector gearbox. Uh, many of the buses at the time, commercial vehicles, have the pre-selector gearbox system. It's a very good um, uh, gearbox to drive with. Um, boxes, uh, Saladin has one, for example, as well. It's a very pleasant um, gearbox to drive. That fails. All the, there are bands in there that, that clamp wheels, and the bands were completely burned out, a bit like a brake lining had been completely burned off in there. So they had to be replaced, but it's still not quite right. We've had, obviously, the vehicle running. You've seen a tank first. You've seen it in the videos, um, but it started slipping in some of the gears. So not in first, so we can only go around in first and in crawler, which is entertaining, but very, very lengthy process. So it's not, it hasn't failed, but it isn't working correctly because it slips in some of the gears. So the guys took it out a few weeks back to look at it again. So they've actually um, got a good, I think it only took them about a day to get it out, to actually now look at this gearbox. We're going to get some external parties in as well, people that overhaul these boxes to actually look at what what has gone wrong. So it hasn't failed, we know that, but what's gone wrong? What's wrong with these bands? Is it not the correct material because it was new material? Is it not the correct thickness? Is it the tension on the bands that's not right? Is it the way it selects it? Sometimes it seems to select two gears at the same time. So we, it is, and I like these processes because although I'm not doing it myself, watching the guys do it and we learn from it. What, what actually doesn't go right and what, how can rectify it? And working with others that, that have more experience on these particular boxes, gearboxes, I really enjoy the process. But yeah, it, it's a typical example of, they've done a fantastic job, a fantastic job on rebuilding this vehicle. But it's always ongoing, you're always learning, it's always like, ah, every time you think you got there, something else crops up. But the rest is, is a really good nick, so I hope once this is set up correctly, or maybe these bands need relining, we do not know, then we have a reliable Matilda too. So Chris, what's next from the restoration workshop perspective? Well, hopefully we complete the Matilda with uh, its uh, working gearbox. And uh, just behind you, as you will have seen, are two more projects to complete. Uh, one is the Valentine suspension, and one is the Churchill uh, Mark III. We hope to have the engine and gearbox uh, back in, hopefully by the end of this year, early next year. Uh, they're all out, hopefully, for Tankfest. Uh, sorry, for Tiger Day in April. That's the plan. So these are the, the three big ones, uh, Matilda II, 
Valentine and Churchill. Um, the next one after that, uh, obviously there's always maintenance ongoing in the background for all these runners. Uh, we hope to um, complete our uh, 105 uh, Centurion Avery, which has been in bids for quite a while and we need to get back to it. So that's hopefully also on the cards for next year. And then we're planning a yet to be confirmed start of a new restoration by the end of next year. Sounds exciting. It is exciting. Yeah. Brilliant. Chris, thank you so much. And thank you to you and your team for keeping history alive. No, thank you for uh, promoting us. The Queen of the Desert was the principal British infantry tank in the early years of World War II. It served with the British Expeditionary Force in France and later in North Africa. Eventually outclassed by the increasingly powerful German anti-tank weapons, especially with the arrival of the Africa Corps and their 88mm guns. It still remained a potent tank in the South East Pacific and was kept in service until the end of the war by the Australian forces. And that's it from Matilda II and myself. Thank you so much for watching. And don't forget, if you like this series, please remember to like and subscribe. Until next time, take care.